Okay. Um, this is our session on producing and deploying HEVC. And the, um, this is our agenda. And I just wanted to catch you up on where HEVC was. Um, and then we'll talk about the encoding side you know, towards the end. And the, the HEVC is a, um, HEVC is a, uh, it's a patent encumbered technology, so you have to pay royalties to use it. And the royalty situation, you know, when we, when we talked here last year, the royalty situation seemed pretty, pretty well in place. Everything, you know, was going to cost you, but it wasn't going to cost you that much. And if you were a content producer, it wasn't going to cost you anything. And then um, HEVC Advance came in, and we'll look at what they proposed. And then there's even rumors of a third patent pool coming out. So HEVC, I think it's been a, it's been a huge step backwards this year. Um, what we know is that MPEG LA, this was the first patent group, and their, their, their proposed royalty structure was, actually it's not proposed, this is what they're charging. It's um, 20 cents per encoder or decoder with a de minimis exception of 100,000. So if you're building your own encoder, um, you're creating your own player for in-house HEBC uh, playback, as long as you don't exceed 100,000 units, um, you don't have to pay anything. Um, and there is a $25 million annual cap. So if you're Apple and you're, you're, you're paying 20 cents a unit for your, you know, for your iPhones, um, it stops at, at $25 million. And that also is, it, you know, that's pretty nice because if you're Apple, that gives you the ability to say, okay, we're going to pay $25 million. We can put it in all the iPhones, all the iPads. We can put it in Safari. We can put it in the Macs. So basically, it's, once you reach that cap, you can put it anywhere. So you look at the companies who are going to reach the, the, the maximum, and you know, companies like Google can do the same thing. You know, we can put HEVC decode in all our Chromecast units. We can put it in Chrome itself. We can put it in Android you know, that we sell. Because of course, the, the, the OEMs that, that sell Android phones are going to pay the royalty, not Google. But if Google sells a device with um, HEVC in it, they pay. And there's no royalty for content. Which was kind of a big deal because there was a, a royalty for, there is a royalty for H.264 in content. So if you sell pay-per-view or subscription-based H.264 encoded content, you owe MPEG LA royalty. So very surprising when MPEG LA came out with the HEBC royalty structure and didn't charge a content royalty. But HEBC Advance took care of that. So HEBC Advance is a group led by GE. Um, and they've got Technicolor and Dolby and, and, and a few other companies uh, in it, including GE. And they came out with, um, with a royalty structure of 80 cents per device. And, and so the royalty structure from their, from their press release slash royalty, um, royalty PDF is on the right. And I kind of you know, pulled from, from the information on the left. So if you're, if you're selling a mobile phone, it's 80 cents a unit. Um, if you're selling a TV, it's about 50. Other devices, and this is where it really stings. Other devices includes browsers, and that's a buck 10. So if you're Chrome, you know, if you're Google and you're shipping Chrome, every browser somebody downloads, you know, there's a cash register in the back that, you know, cha-ching, 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 a buck. So, and there is no cap. So that's a huge deal because, and really, I ran the numbers for an article I wrote, and looking at iPhone six. Sales, which was the first Apple device that had HEBC, it looked like Apple was going to have to write a check for like $120 million. Um, and that's a big number, even if you've got $16 billion in the bank. And then what a lot of people really complained about was the content royalty. So the content royalty is 0.5% of attributable, attributable revenues. So if you're, if you're MGO and you rent a movie for four bucks and it's HEBC encoded, then You've got to pay uh, 20 cents. Is that 20 cents? Whatever the number is, I'm bad, bad with math. But uh, you got to pay 0.5 percent of that four bucks to to uh, HEBC Advance. So this came out. Um, they announced their formation in April. They came out with their royalty structure in June, and it uh, everybody got upset. It was a big it was a big deal. But even worse is that there's a third pool out there 
Um, and there are some pretty significant companies who aren't in either IP pool. So everybody's talked, not everybody, there's a few people like Dan Rayburn who writes for streaming media. He's one of our VPs. He's tracking a third pool that has other content holders who, who, um, who may come out. And of course, if they come out with a royalty structure, then there may be a third royalty. So all of a sudden, HEBC Advance went from a pretty manageable number, or HEBC, a pretty manageable number to you know, these kind of numbers. So this is the annual impl implications of the HEBC Advance proposed royalty. So you know, Apple, they've got more, more than three, but at least three products that would be affected by it. Before HEBC Advance, they would pay MPEG LA 25 million. After HEBC Advance, as I said, it would be hundreds of millions. Um, with Google, you know, they've got Chrome, they've got Android devices sold by Google, they've got OTT devices. Um, again, they go from 25 million to potentially billions. And, and then you can see the numbers for the other, the other companies. Interestingly, Microsoft Edge, which is the browser that succeeds Internet Explorer 11 on the Windows 10 platform, it, it originally had HEBC decode, then they took it out, and now apparently it's back in. So it, it's the only browser I'm aware of that's got HEBC decode, which is a, either Microsoft knows something that we don't, or they're going to end up paying just a fortune. Because it's, you know, they're giving away Windows 10 for free. They said that hundreds of millions of people have downloaded it. So I mean, that's, they're going to pay a buck ten to HEBC Advance for each one of those. So I mean, it's, anyway, this, is, this really upset the apple cart. If you look at you know, Amazon, they're not only on the hook for the hardware, they're on the hook for the content. And that's a big deal. And Netflix, Major League Baseball, you know, they were owing nothing under HEBC Advance and tens of millions after. So Netflix in particular, they're using HEBC. You know, they would end up paying millions and millions of dollars in HEBC royalties that they weren't anticipating. Um, before HEBC Advance came out. So if you have any kids who are looking for work, tell them to go into law and become a patent attorney because there's going to be all kinds of lawsuits coming from this in terms of the, the hardware and the software royalties. And then you know, there's been a pretty chilling effect in, in a lot of different ways. Some, this is all anecdotal. This is um, interesting, but you know, it, it, it's, it's not hard data. But I was speaking to a capture vendor um, you know, one of the big capture companies, and they're basically saying 4K services aren't talking about HEBC anymore. They're, they're coming out with 4K, but they're not saying it's based on HEBC, and they're not allowing their vendors to, to announce the design wins. You can't, you know, they couldn't say, you know, somebody is using our HEBC encoder because nobody wants to be on the record as using HEBC because, I mean, it's not hard to figure out what they're using, but nobody wants to come right out and say it. Um, I heard from a chip IP vendor that he's seeing a lot of interest in VP9 for the first time. So a lot of hardware vendors, a lot of content developers are saying, well, and we'll look at how VP9 compares to HEBC in a few seconds. But he, for the, you know, I asked him this question six months ago. It's like, anybody talking to you about VP9? Because I've been kind of banging the VP9 drum for you know, 18 months now. And he said, nobody. And now he, we, we spoke on another matter, and he said, you know, we're starting to see a lot of interest in VP9 that's going to really manifest in terms of products and content in the next, you know, 6 to 12 months. And Microsoft added VP9 to Internet Explorer 11 Edge. So Microsoft, was, Microsoft and Apple were the big holdouts for VP9 in their browsers. And then Microsoft has added in VP9. So all of a sudden you've got, like, of all the new browsers, you've got, you know, pretty much everybody supporting VP9 playback except for Apple. And Joe Inzerillo, he's he runs um, where he's the technical lead for Major League Baseball. They've got their own streaming company. Um, and his big his big deal was the was the notion of gross revenue. He's basically saying we're not going to pay. This is a big deal. It's really taken the wind out of our interest in H.264 and 4K or H.265 and 4K. And then this was, this was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting industry move where in, in, in early September, some pretty significant companies launched what's called the, the Alliance for Open Media. 
So what they did is, is they merged together the, the codec technologies of Cisco, who had just announced a technology called Thor, um, Google with the VP9, VP10 technology, and Mozilla, who's been working on a, a codec called DALA for a few years. They merged that together into a next-gen codec that's supposed to ship in, I think, the end of 2016. And they've all agreed that all output's going to be royalty-free. So they're all giving away their, their IP because they want to promote you know, a free and open source codec in the, in, the, in the browser space. Now, what's interesting, a couple things are interesting. Number one, Microsoft is in this group, which is you know, why I'm sure they put VP9 in Edge. Because now they're saying, well, we're going, this is the direction we're going in. We're going to jump in with both feet. What's also interesting is that Amazon and Netflix are in the group. So if you, you know, if you, if you look forward and you, you anticipate a world where every smart TV is going to support VP9 or VP Next because YouTube's using it, and you've got Netflix who's shipping a ton of content and Amazon as well, and they're saying, well, like, if I encode in HEVC, I pay 0.5%, and if I encode in, in VP9, it's free, um, you know, they're going to they're gonna start to, to move towards v, VP9 to the extent that's possible. So I think, you know, I, th I think um, from my perspective, last year it was, you know, let's go, HEBC is really starting to make some inroads to, you know, this, this it, it really seems stalled at this point. Okay, so that's the, um, that's kind of the royalty situation. Where's the HEBC quality? We'll talk about what my test said and we'll talk about the University of Moscow just said. And, you know, the expectation for HEVC has always been same quality as H.264 at 50% the data rate. So what I did a couple times now, I've, I've updated this, I think, three times, is I took three files, one an animation, one a, a movie trailer. This, uh, it was the uh, Tears of Steel movie trailer, and then a real-world video test clip that I created, and then I encoded in VP9 and I encoded in... Uh, in HEVC, and then I compared the results. And I looked at two, com two configurations, um, 720p and 1080p. So I didn't look at 4K at all, because I'm more interested in you know, how much bandwidth will HEVC, HEVC save in these pretty common bitstream uh, types? And you know, will it get to the 50%? And then I compared those files to H.264 encoded files. You know, I compared the 720p at 4 megabits and 3 megabits, just to, as a comparison point. And then I assess quality with the Moscow University Video Quality Measurement Tool, um, which gives you an objective score for, for all the file formats. So what this tells us is, I guess these are, these are mauve, but they're, they're green in the, in the spreadsheet. Anything green is where the quality of H.265 at 50% of the data rate was equal to or better than H.264 at twice the data rate. Okay, it's meaning in this column, it's, it's mission accomplished. In the animation, it wasn't quite mission accomplished, but it was the same quality with only a 50% savings. Okay, so HEVC Advanced in my tests delivered the goods. Most vendors claim the same quality between 30 and 50%, depending on the resolution. So this is you know, this is nothing new. Um, Moscow University, has anybody heard of the Moscow University? They put out the, the, the big H.264 comparisons. They've been doing it for years. So they put out their first HEVC comparison in the last probably six weeks. And they did a whole lot more testing than I did. And it was pretty interesting. Oops. They, they encoded 20 test clips. They compared eight HEVC codecs, including X.265, which is the, the HEVC codec that I tested. And they also compared to Google's VP9 and X.264. Now, for my comparisons, Google created the presets. And uh, Multimedia Core created the X.265 preset. So they, you know, I, I sent them some basic parameters. They, they sent me command line encoders, and that's how I created the files. Um, University of Moscow did the same, except I think they're, they're probably the world's best at, at X.264 encoding, and you'll see why that's important in a second. And they used PSNR and SSIM in their comparisons. They didn't use VQM, which is the metric that I used. 
But this is, you know, the, one of their most basic findings was X.265 was the best HEVC encoder in their findings, and VP9 was second, only 6% behind um, HEVC. So there's been a lot of, when I put out my tests, um, that basically kind of formulate, you know, basically just kind of announced this. I, I put it out on the streaming media website, and I got a lot of heat from a lot of people. Um, some of it was pretty ugly, you know, basically saying I was a hack, and you know, I was, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, and there was my results were flawed, and 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 it was very interesting that University of Moscow came out and basically had the same results that I did. You know, they're basically saying VP9 and HEVC are pretty equivalent quality. And then what was even more significant was they said that X.264 is only about 20% behind HEVC. So now we're looking at this environment where, you know, HEVC, HEVC costs a ton, it's the same quality as VP9, and it's not that much better than X.264. And that's, that's just, um, it's almost like the Ronda Rousey fight, you know? I mean, it's like, dang it. And then these are, you know, these are my conclusions. The, the tests I did where I compared VP9 to um, HEBC. Here I used two different test tools. I used the uh, Moscow University video quality measurement tool, and I used the SSIM wave uh, uh, quality of experience monitor. And they concluded, you know, here we saw that uh, VP9 in my latest round of tests was about 9% behind. Uh, X.265, and SQM found it less than 1% behind. So my tests were right along, you know, pretty similar to what, what uh, University of Moscow found. So, you know, why, you know, why am I bringing up VP9 in this discussion about HEVC? Because if the quality wasn't similar, we wouldn't, you know, if the quality wasn't close, we wouldn't be having this discussion. If it was the same quality as, as H.264, nobody would care. But now we've got to, you know, freeze all is better, um, especially when you compare it to a, to a product where the price has gone crazy in the last, the last six months. So, I, you know, where is this going to have an impact? I mean, I'm, I find it hard to think that it's going to have a significant impact in broadcast. Um, but, you know, who knows? With the Alliance for Open Media, they're going to come out with different codecs. Maybe in five years, HEBC is totally, you know, history. I don't know. But broadcast is very standards-oriented to, to a much greater degree than, as comparison, the, the browser, right? Browser is freeform you know, browser vendor can put any codec they want in there pretty simply. So I think in, in broadcast, it's probably not going to be relevant. In OTT, I think it's going to be interesting. You know, it's, it, it, we'll see where the numbers, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits about what's fair and reasonable for HEBC Advance, and we're going to see where those numbers kind of fall out. But until we know what those numbers look like, I mean, there's companies paying hundreds of billion do millions of dollars under the proposed terms. Mobile, we'll see in a second. It could be relevant. Both the Android and the Apple platform now include HEVC. I don't know what Apple does when they look at the first check they have to send to, to HEVC Advance, and it's, you know, it's, it's got nine figures in it. So, you know, does, does really how much consumers don't care whether it's HEVC or VP9, right? I mean, my daughter, she got a new iPhone 6. It's got HEVC. She doesn't care. You know, it, as long as the quality is the same, it's just, it's just not relevant to her. And then, you know, interesting to think about the impact of the, the, the Moscow University report. Um, I don't think it's going to slow market acceptance significantly, but I think a large part of that is, you know, is ATBC advances doing that already. Um, so, my, you know, my take is the quality issues aren't holding ATBC back. ATBC back, I think it's more just, just the business issues, the pricing issues that have come up. Any questions or comments? Anybody? Do we have a microphone or? Yep. Uh, one comment and uh, one question. Uh, the comment is the reason for uh, X264 being so close to X265 in the MSU test as far as I understand, is that they normalized performance. That's what, that was my understanding. So if you look at some of the graphs there, uh, they didn't fully normalize performance, but they divided it into bins. 
offline encoding, 10 FPS, and 30 FPS. So if you look at 30 FPS, real-time encoding, with X264, you can do it with very slow preset. But with X265, you need to use ultra-fast preset in order to get those 30 FPS. And then when you compare the bitrate, the difference is very small. That, that's a good point, but the, I was showing the chart from the, from the slowest test with no speed. Right. There was no speed. Um, right, and that's 20%. In the other test, they even got to a difference of 6% because of normalizing performance. Okay. So, so that, that was the comment. The question is, um, are you sure that in VP9, there are no uh, HEVC patent issues? Because I know the technology is quite similar. And, th and that's the, you know, that's kind of the, the boogeyman, the, the other thing that everybody, and, and I don't, you know, I just don't know because it's, so the, you know, the high level issue is, will the HEVC patent holders sue Google and the Alliance for Open Media? And I wrote an article about that and we got some opinions from, from different people in the marketplace. And we, we don't know, but I mean, that's, we heard the same, we've been hearing about that same issue since, since um, Google open source, you know, VP8. So yes, but in VP8 they licensed from MPEG-LA, I think. Yeah, they did. And they offered they did. Uh, identification but to anybody only using it. It was only 12, not all 13. And yeah. I mean, so there, there are still open HEBC patents that weren't licensed. And, and also, what, what the guys who, who I interviewed for the article said was, there's so many. Everybody's got. They've got patents like cards, you know. So it's like, oh, you want us to pay you for that? Well, you pay us for this. So just because there's a patent, you know, and Google, when they bought Motorola, I mean, so I mean, I think that's, that's, a, that's a possibility. Um, I don't know, it, it certainly doesn't seem like it's gonna slow. You've got Microsoft, Netflix, Amazon, Intel, Google, and Mozilla in the Alliance for Open Media who are all developing based on that technology. So they, that speaks quite loudly about how they think they would prevail in terms of, you know, in, in, in a patent lawsuit against, you know, against the ATVC people. Any other questions or comments? So if, if someone wanted to get licensing for content only, could they go to MPEG LA and just get a license through MPEG LA and be covered? No, I mean, you're gonna, if, if, if you're gonna have to go through every patent group, we'll, we'll need separate licensing. And, and MPEG-LA doesn't have, yeah, you can't, you can't get it from MPEG-LA because they don't have it, they don't charge for it. You have to, you, you, everything is, is uh, you have to pay all groups. You know, it's not like you just can license from one and, and, and that's it, you gotta, and, and H.264 was the same way. So there's, you know, people who use H.264 and their encoders are, are writing two or three checks to different companies. So it's not, it's not all that surprising that it happened. What's surprising is how aggressive HEVC Advance has been with their pricing. You also mentioned that uh, HEVC IP, which is more hardware-based vendors such as Qualcomm and Broadcom, are they in top of the existing uh, I'm sorry, HEVC Advance? So we're talking about HEVC IP. Right. They, they, they charge on extra on top of uh, HEVC advance or different? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just not understanding. Third group, the IP. Okay, I, I don't know, you know, but there's not a lot known about what they're gonna do or when oh, they're gonna come out. It's, it's really, it's, it's like the grassy knoll kind of thing, you know, in mm -hmm. the Kennedy assassination. I mean, it's, it's all often talked about, but not a lot of people not a lot of details are known. All right. Okay, so where, you know, I spoke to several vendors. Um, where is HEBC taking off today? All the 4K television set implementations are HEBC, even though the vendors won't talk about it. And we're seeing HEBC in contribution for both broadcast and live streaming. So if I was live streaming this event, I might have an HEVC encoder because I can send out a two megabit per second stream that has the same quality as a H.264 stream at four megabits per second. And same thing for contribution anywhere in the broadcast space, you know, anywhere that there's either a bandwidth limitation or a bandwidth costs a lot of money, HEVC is a great solution. It doesn't have to be for streaming. You know, there's gonna be a lot of pockets. There's gonna be you know, security applications and 
you know, playback on airplanes and things like that before it ever makes it out into the, the big markets that we're talking about. So these are the markets that are selling now. You know, what's new on the encoding side? You know, this slide really probably didn't change that much from last year. You know, all the traditional vendors now encode in HEBC, most of them in real time. Hardware and, you know, obviously hard, hardware is, is required most of the time for live. All the software vendors are now doing VOD. There's a new hardware architecture from Intel that's kind of a, um, a and one of its uses is a codec coprocessor. And sorry, I, I put a slide in out of order. But this is the, um, the Intel VCA or Visual Compute Accelerator combined with um, H.265 software from uh, Idiom is, is another, you know, we're seeing this as a different live encoding architecture for HEVC. We're also seeing the first wave of smaller encoders. This is a, this is a, a, a product from, uh, from Vitek that uh, it's doing, and this is pretty interesting because it's doing 1920, you know, it's doing 1080p maximum. It's not doing 4K. So this is, they do a lot of military spec stuff. So this is, it's hardened. It's got the metadata for surveillance cameras. So it's, it's, it's really targeted more towards that. But it's interesting that we're starting to see the first, um, the first wave of smaller encoders. It's really being big iron encoders up to this point. And then, you know, in terms of where HEBC is going to take off, you know, how do I see things unfolding in the desktop, mobile, and OTT smart TV markets? Um, I think most of the current generations of PCs that we care about can at the very least play 720p. So these are playback tests, you know, how much CPU is required to play back 720p H, H.264 as compared to HEBC. And, you know, this, this Dell Precision is, I think it's like a 10-year-old computer, and for 720 it was around 40%. Um, so these are pretty old computers that are playing 720p fine. You're not going to see a lot of 1080p on these computers, but again, these are very, very old. These are all before any of the, the, the uh, dual-core uh, current architectures. And then if you're on a, you know, a typical notebook, this notebook's five years old, and even 1080p for HEVC was only at 21%. So I think HEVC will play on most computers you care about, certainly in 720p. The question is, you know, how do you play it? So there's some software players. DivX 10 came out with HEBC in September of 2013. VLC player came out in, in November. Both of those do a fine job decoding HEBC, but they're not installed on enough computers to really say, I'm going to roll out HEBC because you don't have general purpose decode. Um, Flash, Adobe has announced that they're going to include HEBC decode in prime time, but not the general purpose Flash player. You know, 25 million was too rich for their blood. They're not going to do for HEVC what they did for H.264 back in 2006. And they couldn't do it anyway because Flash is going away. So, you know, it's, it's a different market, different time. So the big problem in the, in the browser space is there's no general purpose HEVC player. Um, you know, in terms of browser market share, these are the current versions of all browsers. So Chrome does not have HEVC. It's got VP9. IE 11 does not have HEVC. It does not have VP9. Edge has HEVC now, I think. VP9 is coming. Firefox, no and never will. Yes on VP9. And Safari, no and no. So VP9 gives you a lot more playback uh, computers than, than HEVC does. And, and you know, HEVC with an unlimited cap, it just makes no sense at all for any company to put it in a browser. I mean, it, it's a downloadable free product that, you know, you can't monetize for a buck 20 or whatever the, whatever the cost is. So, so if, if I want to use HEVC, if I'm Netflix or if I'm um, Emgo or if I'm anybody distributing movies, I've got to pay for the player. And, you know, the player cost... I did a calculation, and, and MGO would have to run, a, they'd have to run a movie like 250 times to a particular user to pay the cost of that player. You know, looking at looking at the savings they get from using HEVC as compared to H.264. So the economics of HEVC just don't just don't seem to be.
compelling, particularly because VP9 is free and is very close to the same quality. So I don't. I don't see you know, anybody using HEVC in the computer space um, in the short term. Anybody have any thoughts on that? What about mobile? Um, I think the installed base of mobile, you know, software player only, I think that has battery issues. Um, you know, using HEVC, this is a, a review in TechSpot where they basically said that Playing back HEBC cut the battery life of tablets and phones by, by 50%. So I think there'll be a lot of resistance to using you know, that format. In, um, people would rather use more disk space to get the same quality than lose battery life in most applications. Apple did add HEBC encode decode. Very curious, but they just did it for FaceTime. They didn't not available in the browser, you can't play HEBC video on your iPhone, even though the HEBC encode decode is there. So they're going to have to make a decision on you know, whether or not they want to pay the royalty or just pull it. And you know, who knows? I mean, anybody have any thoughts on that? I mean, it's, it's 100, like I said, it's 120 million for just the iPhone 6. And uh, it really, it's hard to, hard to see that as being justifiable. Uh, pardon? Yeah, but do they, do they design it out? I mean, do they, do they turn it off? You know, do they, so it, you know, do, do they design it out is the big question. Um, Google added software decoder and hooks to HEVC in Android 5. And there's some hardware-capable devices announced. All this came out before HEV Sans was, HEVC Advanced was announced. So it cost Google $25 million. It didn't cost them hundreds of millions. And Google is a member of the Open Media Alliance. So they're, they have skin in the game for, the, for this new generation codex. What are they going to do? You know, and I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, a lot, it's billions of dollars to their overall ecosystem if, if, the, if the royalty you know, is actually held up in court. So in terms of today, you know, HEVC, it's, it's in Apple. It's not being used fully. I'm not sure why. Um, and it's in Android. And it is accessible to be used as much as you want it. You know, so I think Android 5 is now around 30% penetration. So it's, it's getting to be a significant number. Um, and, and we're just going to have to wait and see what happens over the next few years, because it's really going to cost them hundreds of millions, if not billions, if, if the, the royalties don't get changed. And then HEVC on, on OTT and smart TVs, these are the markets. These are the broadcast markets that I think HEVC is going gonna, is gonna to do really well in. Um, HEVC is not on the new Apple TV, which is kind of a, a surprise or not. But I mean, Apple is in the HEVC PAT group in MPEG LA. So you would think they would be very HEBC friendly, um, but they did not put HEBC in, in the new Apple TV. Even more surprising, given that it's in the new 4K Roku and the new Amazon Fire TV. So competitors are putting 4K HEBC based playback in their competitive devices. All the smart TVs that are, you know, all the current smart TVs have 4K playback. Um, all the current smart TVs with 4K have HEVC, and all the relevant specs for you know, hybrid TV in Europe and the Smart TV Alliance in the States, they, they anticipate HEVC in the devices. So you know, again, these, these platforms are very standard sensitive. They're also not that price sensitive. You know, a browser is very different than a $500 TV. You know, add, add a buck to a $500 TV, it's not a big deal. Add a buck to a browser, and it's a huge deal. The question is, how much do you believe in, how much do you believe in UHD sales? Um, the big issue I see with OT, I mean, who here has a 4K TV set? Just you, you. Why are we not, why are we not buying one yet? Why are you not buying one? HDI. H. So there, there are key standards. For, for high dynamic range that are not set. Basically, if you buy a, you know, if you buy a 4K TV set today, you know, you're stupid, according to CNAT. 
Um, don't take that personally. Um, but <laughs> yeah. So it's it's uh, yeah. The TVs are stupid. And um, you can build that smart TV. Yeah, even though it's 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 often muddle over that one at lunch. But the uh, so I th I don't believe in the 4K market because I think the the um, high dynamic range issue has to be set. And I you know not that I'm you know I wouldn't expect every buyer to be as informed on that issue as as I am, but you know, there's a lot of pretty techy. You know, this is uh, Huffington Post is is bringing this out. So I think there's going to be a, the market's not going to take off until this is, issue is resolved. Not to mention the lack of content because nobody wants to to you know create their content multiple times for, for when the HDR spec comes in. And then you also have deliverability issues. So. You know, Netflix is 16 megabits per second for their 4K TV. They're telling you you need 25 megabits per second. Akamai says the average in the States is around 11. Um, the average in Canada is, is around 11 as well. So the average person doesn't have the bandwidth for it anyway. So I just don't believe in OTT um, until the HDR issue is settled, until bandwidth increases. But this is the market that's happening. You know, Amazon's selling, I mean, everybody's doing 4K, and this is the market that's happening. Some of it's over managed networks, some of it's over the internet in general. But this is, this is the place where, where it's, you know, it's thriving. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of content going out, but it's, it's, it's a very small percentage of overall publishers using it. You know, it's probably 50 to 100 publishers out of all the websites in the entire world. So it's a lot of content, small number of publishers using it. And then wanted to spend a little bit of time on, on how to produce HEVC and some of the things that I've seen. You know, general concept is, is very much the same. This is an elemental white paper. Um, you know, you've got the basics that you've seen before, like, you know, intra prediction, you know, the I frames, you've got I frames, B frames, P frames. Same thing with H.26. This is MPEG 2, this is H.264, this is H.265. So you've got the same, same uh, frame sequence types. You've got you know, similar transform, similar motion estimation with some advancements. But none of this stuff is going to be all that hard to figure out once you start encoding. Different encoders are going to present different quality versus speed trade-offs. This is from the Elemental uh, server VOD encoder. So you see all the typical. H.264 parameters that you see or are familiar from H.264. And for HEVC, they have a four-step trade-off between quality, which you know, high quality is zero, and high density, or more speed, is three. So this is, these are the only way you can adjust HEVC encode options in the elemental uh, encoder. And I think that's a good thing, because you really can start going down the rabbit hole if you have more, more options to, um, to play with. With, um, with X.265, you can choose a preset. This is from the uh, Telstream Vantage user interface. And a preset controls a range of parameters. And X.265 published this. This is basically the settings you use for every preset in their command line encoder. So the big issue with preset always is you know, how much quality and how much encoding time. And these are normalized results, so ultrafast is the fastest preset. It took 1.23% of the time it took for the highest quality preset, delivered 41% of the quality. And if you chart this out, this is the quality graph here. This is the time graph here. Medium is usually the, um, the default preset. So you see at medium, you're at 4% of the encoding time, and you're at about 83% of the quality. So you really can figure out, you know, if you really need 100% or close to 100% as you, as you can get, maybe you move up to the, to, to the slow or the slower, but you start to see significant increases in encoding time to get that additional quality. Very different from X.264. X.264, you got 98% of the quality at, the, um, at this preset here. So much, it seems like the presets are doing a lot more effective stuff here than they were doing in, in, in X.264. Main concept uses the same thing. They use PQ values instead of presets. 
And then, you know, here's average encoding time. Here's, in, you know, and I did the same kind of graph here for this is the quality and this is the encoding time. And we see at PQ of 22, you've got still a very short encoding time and you've got like 93% of the quality. So if you want to get more, you're going to start to see significantly higher, um, significantly higher encode times. So I mean, it basically, it's you know H.265. It's not been a good year for it. You know, I think the market conditions really got a lot more confusing. I think during that period, the encoding side has firmed up. I think the playback side has stalled, and that's kind of the that's kind of the important side. And I think you know 2016 is going to be a big year where we'll see some of the lawsuits that will figure out whether HEBC advances, their terms will hold, and we'll also start to see if a third patent group is, is coming in. Um, but it's, it hasn't been a great year for HEBC. Any questions or comments? Or? Let, me, let me get you the microphone. Regard, regarding encoding, uh, kind of a neophyte here, but are either of those uh, HEBC or VP9 available on Adobe's Creative Cloud? Uh, Premier on, Pro. On which? Premier Pro. Um, Premier Pro, good question. There are, there are plugins that let you access both of them. And if you, if you Google my name, Premier Pro, VP9, and HEBC, I wrote a blog post on it. So you'll be able to, to, um, you'll be able to find out. Okay, thank you. Anybody using HEBC out there? What do you, what's your application? Pardon? Okay, just testing. Anybody else? Somebody else raise their hand. Anybody using VP9? Anybody using 4K? <laughs> Why are you people here? What are you, what are you doing? Pardon? Okay. Say it again. Oh, right, right. Uh, I don't know. Good question. So is the, four, is the GoPro 4K HEBC? I don't know, but that's a good question. Does anybody know? Okay, the presentation, the slides will be up on the streaming media website probably in the next couple of days. My website is Streaming Learning Center, so if you write that down, I'll put it up there by the end of the day today. Okay, we're done. Thanks for coming. <laughs>